everybody on YouTube. Thanks, John. So anyway, we wanted to welcome everybody to the first edition of our CPF book club. We want this to be a sort of an exciting new place where we can enhance uh, our community and just talk about books with our favorite authors and photographers, historians, and architects. So the first one that uh, we're bringing in are two really good friends of CPF and preservation. Um, oh, we have some more things to talk about, though, John. We want to make sure that everybody, uh, if you have your phone handy, as John mentioned in in the um, before we open the room, we're going to be using the phone to participate in a, a trivia quiz. We could also use your computer uh, desktop. So we'll get to that uh, in the end. John's posting uh, some stuff in the chat. Uh, this one in particular, we want everyone to feel free to use the chat as much as possible. I saw Nelson in the chat and as usual, you know, we encourage everybody to uh, post where you're calling in from because we do get people from around the country. We have, I know that one of my friends from Florida is uh, logging in and we also have friends uh, from other, well, Georgia, Nelson, and we have other people from around the country. So go ahead and, and log and put in the chat where you're calling in from. If you put your stuff in the chat, people can see that you're in there and you might meet some more friends, which I made some friends this year. How about you, John? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're really <laughs> excited to have some people. For those of you who would like to uh, have a conversation with our speakers today, we're going to try to encourage people to jump in on video and sound. So we want you to raise your hand if you'd like to ask your question in person. So click the raise hand symbol. I'll keep an eye out for that. Um, we might have some special guests jump on uh, during our Q&A, so uh, keep an eye out for that. And as we mentioned the quiz, I typed into the chat box um, the website that you would go to to start the quiz. Again, that quiz won't start until uh, after our speakers present. And the website you will visit is pigeonhole.at, and then you would type in preserving to be involved in the quiz. Make sure you type in your name if you want to show up on the leaderboard. Yeah, because someone's going to win the eternal gratitude of CPF. And right. speaking of gratitude, we want to thank the, the donors to this program. It helps us uh, bring these programs to everybody for free. Uh, what, who were the names, John? Do you recall now? We had a couple. We had William was donating. And also, uh, I can't remember the last name. Anyway, thank you very much for donating, everybody. Oh, we had a special thank you to... Um, let me see. Oh, I can't remember, John. Anyway, uh, please do consider donating to consider continue these programs. And one more last quick announcement. Uh, we have Alan Hess coming up on August 31st. And then after that, uh, we have Allison Rose Jefferson. And we'll be talking about uh, sites in Los Angeles uh, from the diverse communities that we are working it to preserve. And she will be sometime in November. So we do plan to continue this book club uh, into the rest of this year. All right, so we'd like to welcome our speakers for today, an author and a photographer. Everyone is familiar, I hope, with Ken Bernstein and Stephen Schaefer. Come on in. Hey, Ken, how are you? We, you're still muted, Hi, Chris, Ken. Hi, Chris yeah. and John, great to see you both. <laughs> Thank you and welcome to our initial book club. We really appreciate you uh, being a game to work with us on this. And I know that you've been working so hard in historic preservation in Los Angeles and your perspective is really valuable. So uh, when we get to the uh, conversation, it's not just gonna be about the book, but it's gonna be about like the, the pursuit really that you've been engaged in for you know decades basically to do this historic preservation in LA. But um, I wanted to just tell people a little bit about the book. It is from Angel City Press. There's uh, seven different chapters which go over quite a bit of including an afterward, which is the American city after COVID, which I thought was fascinating that you had that in there. And then also an appendix that I've heard a lot about and I wanna talk about more on the other end of your presentation about Survey LA discoveries, which I've heard is very important part of the book and also is valuable as a tool that people can use to tour actually Los Angeles and find these some of these sites on their own. Um, the book is about 240, 250 pages. And how many sites did you feature in the book, Ken? Uh, I don't know the exact count, over 300 sites uh, throughout the city uh, in all communities of Los Angeles. It's, it's such an exciting publication. So uh, if you want to go ahead and share your screen and go ahead and tell it and give everyone a, a little overview of what you've done. Great, happy to do that. Um, 
So uh, yeah, well, thanks, Chris. Thanks, John, for uh, for having us today. Um, let's see here. There it goes. Okay. Let's try this again. Okay, there we go. Um, so yeah, good afternoon, everyone. It's really such a pleasure to be with both of you and with CPF, kind of the extended historic preservation uh, family in California. And uh, both Stephen Schaefer, Schaefer uh, and I are really pleased to share uh, preserving Los Angeles with all of you, uh, with so many of you who really make historic preservation possible for all of us in California and within your own of communities in the, in the state. And uh, Shafe will be sharing some of the uh, it, it, photographic experiences of putting this book together and the way we approached it. But I just wanted to indicate, you know, uh, he is uh, has been the perfect collaborator for this project. Many of you know Shafe from his involvement with CPF on the board and in preservation throughout the state and in his own community in, in Ventura. So he was the perfect collaborator, just the obvious choice to give visual life to this Los Angeles preservation story. Um, and so wanted just to share for a few minutes a little bit of a taste of uh, what this book is and some of the motivation for putting it together. I had really decided to take on this book because obviously there've been many books on Los Angeles, it's architecture, it's history, but I felt like the story of preservation in Los Angeles had not really been told. Um, and particularly the ways in which historic preservation can be a positive force for our city, as well as for other communities across California and across the nation. Um, you know, the often, as many of you know, the perception is that historic preservation can be about blocking change or stopping progress. And I really felt like we had a story to tell in Los Angeles about how preservation has been really a primary engine for change in uh, you know, creating a downtown renaissance, as you see here uh, along Broadway, our historic core in Los Angeles and transforming many of our neighborhoods and residential communities, and even in creating um, new housing opportunities across the state. And I wanted to bring that story to a larger audience in our city and to kind of hold up some of our Los Angeles experiences uh, as we hope, uh, a less, some lessons learned for other communities, large and small across the state and across the, the nation. And so this really was sort of a labor of love for me, a side project. I direct the Office of Historic Resources within the LA City Planning Department. And I think many of you may know me previously having been a preservation advocate for the Los Angeles Conservancy. So I'm pretty busy, but I took this on for about two years as my, what I call my weekend project. And it was a labor of love. Um, in that spirit, I also decided I wanted to donate my proceeds from the book to three organizations that really support inclusion, diversity, and representation in the historic preservation field. Uh, the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund, part of the National Trust. Uh, Latinos in Heritage Conservation and APIA HIP, Asian and Pacific Islander Americans in Historic Preservation. And uh, the work of all three organizations really reflect many of the key themes uh, of the book as well. Um, so to give you just a little bit of a taste of the book and, and some of its themes, uh, in addition to uh, some of the specific content about how Los Angeles has been transformed by Historic Preservation, I wanted to kind of channel my own kind of uh, continued sense of discovery about Los Angeles, the unique perspective I have in being able to see remarkable historic places and sites across the city, really like this one, uh, the Garden of Oz, that um, we were very fortunate to get permission to uh, have Shea photograph. Uh, this is a kind of a secret garden in the Hollywood Hills. Um, Gail Cotman, the property owner uh, who uh, made this all possible, worked with about 75 artists uh, friends of hers, uh, Beatrice Wood and many others, to create this children's folk art and peace garden, um, highlighting everything from uh, kind of peacemakers like the Dalai Lama or Rosa Parks to musical figures from Ella Fitzgerald to Duke Ellington. And uh, um, you know, this is a, a remarkable historic site that's now designated as a city historic cultural monument. And so often as I go about my work and have a chance to tour sites across Los Angeles, I've often wanted to just kind of bring people along with me to see what I'm, uh, you know, ha I have the, uh, the great privilege in many cases to be able to see. And I wanted to share some of that with a larger audience. But I also want to really share the power of historic preservation tools, including historic designation, the designation of local landmarks, or what we call in Los Angeles, our historic cultural monuments, 
um, which in many, in many cases protected sites from demolition, like this one, the Idle Hour, which is a great example of uh, programmatic architecture, um, you, know, uh, you know, where the form of the building reflects its use. This had been a bar uh, in the form of a whiskey barrel from 1941 in the community of North Hollywood and had deteriorated over uh, many decades. Uh, it uh, actually had been a flamenco uh, dinner theater and the woman who, uh, who ran that and danced in the theater, Dolores Fernandez, actually grew old living in the second story apartment above the bar. She was the old woman who lived in a whiskey barrel like the Mother Goose <laughs> nursery rhyme, the old woman who lived in a shoe. But this was threatened when she passed away. Its historic cultural monument designation led to its being purchased and transformed by Bobby Green his, and his partners called, called the 1933 Group, which had taken on a number of historic nightclubs and bars around Los Angeles. And they spent about $2 million um, rehabilitating the barrel and then relocating another example of programmatic architecture, actually a replica of what had been the 1928 Bulldog Cafe on Washington Boulevard in Los Angeles. It had been in the Peterson Automotive Museum, and this was relocated to the, uh, the patio. But an example of one of many in the book about how historic cultural monument designation not only provides for recognition, but can lead to the preservation and transformation of historic sites. Uh, we also discuss the power of historic district designation. LA's historic districts are called historic preservation overlay zones, and we have 35 of those um, in Los Angeles. We have, I think, the second largest program of local historic districts in the country, about 21,000 properties um, in those districts. Um, and the book tells the story about how uh, the designation of those HPOZs uh, has led to dramatic transformation and a sense of community in many of these areas. I only had room in the book to tell a sampling of those stories, of course, given the range and diversity of our historic districts in Los Angeles. But one of the points I really wanted to underscore was the diversity of many of our historic districts, both within the districts and among the various historic districts in Los Angeles, both ethnic and socioeconomic um, diversity these are neighborhoods that continue by and large to attract a vibrant mix of residents of all backgrounds and actually have uh, a percentage of non-white residents that's higher than our, our citywide average. And I think that's unusual, or at least it's different from the perspective many people have about what historic districts are and who lives in historic districts. One of those is the Jefferson Park um, HPOZ. And I love this photo that Shafe captured not only showing the uh, kind of unity of the, of the residential stock within the district, but how drought tolerant landscape can be inserted uh, within a historic district setting. Um, and the HPOZ in Jefferson Park has really helped, helped knit together and create a sense of community um, within a, uh, a very diverse uh, neighborhood. Um, this is a book that uh, has spectacular photos, as you can see, of historic architecture but I also wanted to make sure that the reader didn't forget that preservation is ultimately about people who uh, give life to these spaces and inhabit them and people who make historic preservation possible in the first place, like so many of you um, who are involved with CPF. And so it was very important to me that we included um, a series of about 10 preservation profiles in the book um, that uh, illustrate just a handful of the people who've made preservation possible in many ways, both traditional preservationists and non-traditional preservations. Michael Diaz shown here was the driving force behind the creation of our Lincoln Heights Historic Preservation Overlay Zone. Kristen Hayashi uh, was a uh, PhD student at UC Riverside who got involved with the Little Tokyo Historical Society and took on a historic cultural monument nomination for the Japanese hospital in Boyle Heights, telling the story of how um, immigrant doctors built a, um, a medical facility and medical infrastructure for communities that were being discriminated against in terms of healthcare, medical care during those decades. And so uh, wanting to give life to those stories and allow these individuals to tell their story in their own words uh, through the book was that was very important. Um, I think we all know in historic preservation, we have a lot of work to do in many other ways, particularly in moving toward greater uh, inclusion and representation. That's certainly true in Los Angeles. I don't wanna paint a completely rosy picture of preservation. We still only have about 6% of our city historic cultural monuments that reflect the heritage of communities of color um, in Los Angeles. 
We have taken a number of steps to create preservation frameworks, uh, what many of you in the field know as historic context statements to um, lay the groundwork for uh, enhancing that representation in the field. And the book shares some of that work in, in some considerable detail and through illustrations of some of the context that we've created that reflect the diverse history of Los Angeles communities, like our African-American context addressing themes including racial covenants, the history of the Black church and the civil rights movement in LA. This is a historic resource that reflects the, the history of uh, African-American newspaper, which was really a source of information and community connectedness. This is the Joseph and Charlotta Bass house in um, Southeast Los Angeles. They were the editors and co-publishers of the California Eagle newspaper. And this is a house uh, with uh, you know, uh, some interesting architectural detail as well, those porch piers with clinker brick, clinker brick that's painted, a home from 1911 that's also in one of our HPOZs, the 52nd place um, HPOZ. We also highlighted the Latino Los Angeles context, the influence of Latinos in the, the visual arts uh, and the mural, mu muralist movement in Los Angeles. This is the Great Wall of Los Angeles, a remarkable uh, resource in the San Fernando Valley, the work of Judy Baca, the artist who worked with her nonprofit Spark, the Social and Public Art Resource Center over a decade, working with youth to paint sequentially panels that really tell an alternative social history of Los Angeles and California. And we're very proud that the work we did on the historic context, the Latino context led to our Office of Historic Resources advancing the Great Wall of Los Angeles successfully for national register status about four years ago. And we wanted to tell the uh, LA adaptive reuse story, the work of uh, our adaptive reuse ordinance adopted a little over 20 years ago that cleared away some of the impediments to converting historic buildings to housing. It resulted in more than 9,000 new housing units in LA in the, about the first decade that that ordinance was in effect. Um, this is one of several examples in the book, the uh, subway terminal building downtown, which uh, even many Angelinos uh, don't realize that we once had a subway uh, that uh, predated our, our red line and current metro rail system. This was uh, the hub of uh, what was uh, uh, originally intended to be a larger subway system, but was a one mile subway segment that served 65,000 daily commuters in this building in World War II but the train stopped running, the building became more dilapidated by the 1990s and the adaptive reuse ordinance allowed this to be converted to 277 apartments um, in 2003. It's called Metro 417. You can see the beauty and authenticity of uh, the historic rehabilitation and also how the story of how our historic preservation incentives like the Federal Rehab Tax Credit and the Mills Act Historical Property Contract Program, both were used in this building we now have the state tax credit thanks to CPF and wanting to tell the story of how preservation incentives are also part of transformation. And then adaptive reuse, not only in downtown LA, but and not only for housing, but for businesses and uh, in other parts of the city. This is the Spruce Goose Hangar of Howard Hughes, where he built his famous flying boat, the Hercules H4, um, only flew once famously. And uh, this was vacant for a few decades in our Playa Vista community near the coast. Google, when they came to town, they uh, uh, fixed upon this site and worked with ZGF architects to insert a, a building within a building and really create a, a dramatic and a wonderful space for a creative office use. Uh, and it's now the anchor of what's often called Silicon Beach in Los Angeles. And just to close and then turn it over to Shafe, a large part of the book uh, features uh, some of what I call Survey LA Discoveries, which uh, captures the work of our Citywide Historic Resources Survey, a partnership between the, uh, the city and the J. Paul Getty Trust over about a decade to conduct our first ever comprehensive survey of historic resources so that we would know what and where our historic places are in the city. And the book really features um, interesting finds and discoveries from all 35 of our community plan areas across Los Angeles. And to, to tell the story that every community, no matter its characteristics, have remar has remarkable um, historic resources, architectural uh, resources that are dramatic and captured by shape in the book, but also more modest sites that have social and cultural significance. And we want to capture a cross section of all of those. So with that, I'm happy to um, hand it over to Shafe to, uh, tell a little bit more about how we captured some of this visually.
All right. Um, here I am. Uh, my name is Steve Schaefer. Um, everyone knows me as Schaef, and I'm an architectural photographer and uh, collaborator with Ken on this fabulous book about Los Angeles. So this, this allowed me to really um, drive all the highways and byways and, and learn Los Angeles. Um, but I thought I would mix up my show that I have been presenting and, and do a fast-paced show of some of the little tiny photographs that are in the book that you might not notice or you might just glance at, put them up on screen, full screen, and uh, <clears throat> you know, sort of show you a little best of. So um, I can share my screen here, and we'll see what that looks like. Um, keynote. Share. Let's see if that works. All right. So um, there we go. So here is that exterior of that church that Ken was just showing, um, the 1961 Congregational Church by Jones and Emmons, which is interesting and pointy, but it is nothing like the inside, which is an OMG moment. It really is, which is appropriate because, you know, G. And then I also wanted to race through some small photos you may have missed in the book. There are, uh, here's some of my favorite HCMs, the Deodore Cedar Trees on White Oak Avenue in Granada Hills, which is HCM 41. Um, Franklin Avenue Bridge in Los Feliz, also known as the Shakespeare Bridge, which is HCM 126. The Giant Binoculars in Venice, HCM 656. And HCM 598, uh, the 1935 Gilmore Gas Station Adaptive Reuse in Hollywood, which is actually in the Adaptive Reuse chapter and not in the HCM chapter, but there's a lot of crossover like that. And then here's a picture that didn't make it into the book, um, but is still mentioned in the text. Uh, I like it because the sky reflects in the shiny brass letters and you can't tell that the pedestrians are all wearing masks. Um, so let's check out some of my own personal Survey LA best ofs. Um, this is the best of list of the places that that army of Survey LA consultants found during um, that process. And uh, we can start with the tallest photos, uh, the 1929 Bendix building downtown, and on the right, the 1931 Vision Theater in Limert Park. Limert Park, and in the middle, the 1960 Valley Federal Bank Tower in North Hollywood, which if you shoot it on summer solstice like this, the north facade is actually lit for just a moment, right around sunset. So that's about as lit as that building ever gets. And then the flattest photo, the 1926 Bothwell Ranch in Tarzana. It's one of the last remaining orchards in the valley. The wettest photo, the 1972nd Los Angeles Aqueduct in Silmar. The tikiest photo, I think, the 1964 Tahitian Village in Reseda. It's all lava, rock, and palms. It's like the ultimate apartment building. The most neonist, um, the Casa de Cadillac showroom in Sherman Oaks from 1949. Classic. And then how about the best upside down arch and circular leaded glass? in the 1964 Congregational Church of Chatsworth. I, would, I haven't been inside that, but I really would love to see those windows. How about putting the eclectic in Spanish eclectic? This is the 1926 to about 1929 Brunswick Avenue Fantasy Bungalows in Atwater Village. Uh, they may not all be Spanish, but they are definitely all eclectic. Uh, some crazy windows. How about Mr. Showmanship's house, the Liberace house, 1953, with the piano-shaped swimming pool in Encino. I didn't get to see the pool. The Flying Nunniest. Look at that roof line on the 1963 Longshoremen's Union Training Center in Wilmington. Best use of windows, a lot of windows. The 1942 Van Cleef House in Westwood by Richard Neutra. Best placement of a bonsai tree for a photographer. The 1961 Hong Wanji Buddhist Temple in Arlita. The most magnetic. How about the 1956 Scott Exposed Steel House by Pierre Koenig in Tahunga? 
Best Double Take, the 1936 William Kessling designed twin streamlined modern houses in Silver Lake. Not exactly the same, but pretty amazing to see them next to each other. Best House Wearing a Hat, the 1952 Hearn House in Beverly Glen by Lloyd Wright, the Younger. And of course, the Googiest. I know, let's all go to pans now and have flapjacks. Anyway, get your safety vests and your caution stickers ready. There's a lot of LA out there waiting to explore and historic LA is waiting for you. And you don't even need a 65 page shot list to enjoy it. So that's it. I am gonna stop my share. If I Thank you, Shay. That's funny. I always like the way that you uh, bring your humor to all of your presentations. Um, what we want to do next is John and I just want to talk to you two just for a minute, and then we'll do our quiz, and then we'll have the audience come in with all the questions and questions that you have. So if you have a question already, go ahead and post it into that Q and A box. And also in the chat, I'm wondering if in the chat people could post what is your favorite building so far? I'm captivated by those twins that you talked about, Shafe. That's yeah. amazing. That's so cute to have two of them together like that. Yeah, one of them was a landmark and one of them was a survey LA find, which was kind of kind of unique. Well, I wanted to ask both of you, how did, so I know that you've been doing Survey LA forever, which was enormous and fantastic effort. Ken, whatever drove you to think that you should also do a book on top of that? Was that part of the original Survey LA plan? It was not, it was not part of the plan. Uh, the survey kind of spoke for itself. It, you know, it was, a, it was sort of a decade long uh, effort. Um, yeah, it, it took a village to do the survey. I think there are a lot of folks who are uh, on with us today who were part of Survey LA in one way or another. It really took the entire uh, preservation community of Los Angeles and beyond to accomplish that over um, you know more than a about a 10 year period from start to finish. Uh, by the time the final field surveys were completed in 2017, and we had about 200 volunteers uh, involved with it in one way or another as well. Um, but you know, we we put the survey findings up online through our uh, comprehensive inventory. That's another partnership with the Getty called Historic Places LA. So everything is mappable and searchable on historicplacesla.org. But I kind of felt like that, that uh, you know, there's something about having a kind of a physical leave behind, you know, something that's that's tangible and that, that's not just uh, out there online. Um, and as I thought about the enormity of what we had done in uh, in Survey LA. Um, you know, I kind of felt like it would be helpful to, to have something uh, between two covers that uh, documented all that work. And the, but the book is about more than Survey LA as well. And I kind of felt like um, in addition to uh, kind of showing the range of resources that we have in the city, I wanted to make a larger point about um, the power of historic preservation and some of what, what we've done more generally in Los Angeles and what may be applicable, we hope, for uh, other cities. Um, large and small. And uh, so the, the book is is kind of two in one. It, it, it is illuminating a Los Angeles, I hope will be surprising to many um, through the eyes of Survey LA in many ways, but also um, something that will be useful to the, um, to the preservation community and to anyone who cares about cities in California or beyond. That's, that's amazing. And Shape, I wanted to ask you a question. How did you two meet? And how did Ken come to you and say, would you take about a 1000 pictures all across <laughs> Los Angeles? <laughs> Tell us that story. Um, Ken and I met uh, probably about 13, 14 years ago now. Uh, he was still at the LA Conservancy. And we were starting up a conservancy in the city of Ventura. And so I was calling him and talking with him years and years ago about, well, what should, what should we do with our mission statement? And how should we set up, you know, uh, uh, something that is as cool as the LA Conservancy? And, and, and he was giving me tips and and sending me the mission statement of the LA Conservancy and things like that that we could that we could you know sort of use as inspiration. So uh, that all came down to the CPF. See, CPF is where things happen. CPF then happened in Palm Springs uh, a few years ago, and uh, Ken said, "Hey, can I meet you in the lobby? And can we talk about a project I have in mind?" and and he said, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm writing a book or I wrote a book. Um, and, and actually, I was just mentioning this to somebody the other day who was flipping through the book and didn't realize that it wasn't written during COVID. It was photographed during COVID. And um, 
but it wasn't written during COVID. I think I think Ken had most of the book sort of put put to bed by the time all of this craziness happened. So um, he, we just sat down and I said, well, absolutely, I want to do this. I want to be that guy who photographs this because it's it's my passion as well as my as well as my. Well, and, and Shay snuck in there that mention of the 65 page shot list. I, he mentioned that at most of the events we've done yeah. together. That is true. I'm not sure he completely knew until that moment what he was what he was getting into I mean, and the, the enormity of the city that, you know, the size of Los Angeles, 470 square miles, the, the richness and array of historic resources and the ambition of the project and, you know, what we were trying to capture in the book. So I'm grateful that he said yes, maybe before the reality dawned, uh, dawned on him. And, you know, again, as I said, he was the perfect partner. We had worked together as well. He had actually trained many of our historic preservation consultants through SurveyLA early on when we were doing pilot surveys to test the methodology, was training them as to how to best capture visually um, it, you know, the, the information that we wanted to capture through Survey LA and how to do photography for, you know, consultants who, uh, you know, maybe are more, uh, more about writing architectural descriptions and doing research and really hadn't thought about how to capture a shot that conveys information about historic resources. So Shafe was part of that effort as well and was a part of the Survey LA process. Now, one thing I noticed about the book was that there were profiles of people um so i have a copy here and i don't know if it shows up mm, no you Stop can't see it. not so much um <laughs> no but um throughout the book there are profiles of people like linda dishman and brenda levin and gail Kennard, who might appear here in a minute but um what i'm wondering what what your thought process was behind choosing these people why uh, it, it's a broad mix of preservation type people uh, from all types of disciplines and how did you go about uh, selecting these people well, it was hard. Like like every aspect of this book, you had to, had to make some really difficult choices. And I think there's there's about ten preservation profiles. And obviously, the the preservation village that I refer to is is much larger than that. So this this these are people who are really kind of representing kind of larger um, you know larger kind of. Uh, uh, trends or um, uh, you know roles that people play in historic preservation. I wanted to capture as well that preservation may, is made to happen not only by traditional preservationists. And yes, we have Linda Dishman as a CEO of the LA Conservancy, Brenda Levin, legendary historic preservation architect, and and uh, you know ar architect in many other um, new projects as well in Los Angeles. But I wanted to also have non-traditional preservationists reflected, people who maybe don't even call themselves preservationists, but what they're doing uh, has resulted in tremendous preservation outcomes. And so um, I showed, uh, as, you know, as an example, Kristen Hayashi of Little Tokyo Historical Society. She's someone who had a history background, but had never been involved in organized preservation advocacy. Um, Bobby Green, who I mentioned briefly with the Idle Hour, he's a preservation profile uh, as well. Uh, he's a business owner and, um, uh, you know, uh, I don't know that he's necessarily someone who um, thinks of himself as a preservation advocate, but what he's done in transforming the Idle Hour, the Highland Park Bowl, and another one of our um, HPOZs, uh, the Formosa Cafe, uh, legendary site in West Hollywood, um, you know, he, he understands the economic value of historic preservation, um, the added value of that history and authenticity in creating businesses of that type. A woman named Renee Gunter, who's a resident in the Jefferson Park HPOZ, really was someone, she designed that drought tolerant landscape that I showed on the Jefferson Park HPOZ. That was something that she, so she's a landscape designer, has worked in or, organic foods, but really helped create a uh, block club and um, 4th of July parties in the Jefferson Park neighborhood that created a sense of community that helped build the support over time for uh, an HPOZ among a, you know, a very diverse group of residents in that neighborhood. Um, so she's not someone who's uh, you know, a, a professional historic preservation. So I wanted the book to show that array of, uh, of ways that uh, both professionals and regular citizens can connect to the historic preservation process. And a question for Shafe to follow on that, and then we'll jump into the quiz. And before I ask this question for Shafe, I just wanted to remind people that you can go to uh, pigeonhole.at, type in preserving, or you can go to pigeonhole.at slash preserving, 
and that's where you can start the quiz. Just type in your name, and that way, uh, if you are on the leaderboard, you'll end up uh, at the end of the questions. But um, this question is for Shafe because I know that in the process of photographing many of these sites, we had just jumped into COVID, right? Things were changing downtown in many ways. And um, I'm wondering how that changed your, your view of these sites um, and how it changed the process of photographing them and what, what made it uh, different from going out and photographing Habs types photo, photos that you were previously. Well, um, the, the short answer is that I got from one place to another really fast because there was nobody on the freeway. Um, but uh, the long answer is I, after starting, you know, some of the some of the districts and some of the community areas uh, like Garvanza where, you know, or Highland Park where there's where there's people on the streets, you start to realize that all those people on the streets have masks on. So that might not be, you know, you know, it's like if we're, if we're trying to make a document and a book that's about this point in time, that might be appropriate, but that wasn't necessarily necessarily what I was after. And there's so many photographs in the book without people that it just seemed the consistency uh, of not having masks and, and, and just having a, having a, a very documentary style um, came into play. And so that, that was sort of how I approached it. Uh, you know, let's, let's not make it about the people uh, in my case, let's make it about the buildings, the structures, the sites. Um, and you know, there's just the diversity of the sites, um, and and most people didn't want to talk to me, so there was there was that too. So, I had a question to follow up, uh, shape on that, um, uh, and uh, because my dad is watching and he's a photographer, so what kind of cameras did you use? A lot of people are curious when you've come on our webinars, like what kind of equipment did you use to do all these photos? Yeah, almost the whole the whole book was shot with. Uh, uh, handheld, not on tripods, except for the night views, um, on a Canon digital camera uh, with a 16 to 35 wide angle lens, um, which tends to be, you know, the, the, the wide angle is the, the place where architectural photographers live. So I, I don't even own any real telephoto sports lenses because my interiors tend to be, you know, wide angle um, as much as I possibly can get. And there's a, a lot of times I can't bank, back up any further because I've already run into the building behind me. So especially downtown in order to get those really tall views. Did you hear that, Dad? Anyway, so I know he's watching on Facebook. Um, so we are going to start this quiz. So if you want to, I'm going to share my screen and uh, you can use your phone and QR code or you can. How's that screen look, John? Uh, yeah, you can it use looks the, great. OK, <laughs> so you can enter the passcode preserving and it should pop up, right, John? The it quiz? will. So I'm going to leave it. I haven't started the quiz yet because I want people to have time to look at this screen and um, visit that page and type in the uh, code or they can use their QR scanner on their phone. Um, yeah, you could just take your the camera on your phone and you just aim it right there and it'll say open in Safari. We all have to use these for menus now, right? So uh, then the quiz will open right up and you can use the question the identity is like mine says play is helpful owl so you can either use that or you can put your first name in um, or you can join anonymously so we will give you about 15 seconds here before i start the quiz and our two book authors co-authors will uh, and photographer will uh, read the questions all in alternate order um, and uh, the winner will be showing up on the leaderboard with a nice little trophy but, but below their name. So just so you know you won, you'll you'll see your name up there. I, I see and we when have you got, 30. And you get best best game on Tron. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Do they get kicked off the next time someone's at the arcade? No, I know. So we have 31 people in there. Do you want to go ahead and start, John? Here we go. All right, I will start with the first question. In what year was Los Angeles's first local historic district, Historic Preservation Overlay Zone, or HPOZ, established? And you have four choices. And we'll just give everyone about 10 seconds to answer. So do what you, I can see it on the phone. This is the, this is interesting, John. <laughs> this is our first time trying this out. And if you change your mind, you can still change the answer. So if you realize you answered wrong, just select the other option. Um, we're not going to give you any hints. This is a, a nice competitive game. I'm seeing the results coming in. It's interesting to see the answers. I think yeah, we, we have, have 34, 34 
34 of 34 people. So I think we're Let's ready go. to reveal. So it looks wow. like- Wow, uh, everybody's so smart. <laughs> <laughs> looks like roughly half of the people got it wrong. Um, yeah. but That was yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and we will, and you should see on your phone or your uh, browser whether or not you got it correct. Uh, we're going to go on to the next question. Oh, first we'll see the leaderboard. Uh, it looks like Carl is, uh, a number of people are leading so far. So you'll see a lot, <laughs> you, you might see your name up there. Okay, okay. Shafe. Oh, wait, wait, John has to explain the image on this real quick. Yeah, and I don't know if you're able to click on that image, Chris, to increase oh, it. Oh, can I do that? See if you can. Uh, no, because no. I'm doing the, the thing. So on your browser or on your phone, you, there should be a little expand the image and you can see the image a little closer. But if you can't see it, I'll explain it to you. This is the danger sign that Shafe showed. It's in downtown Los Angeles. It's brass um, letters on this sidewalk, embedded in the sidewalk. So you can go ahead and answer this. Oh, wait, Shafe, do you I already just read your question? <laughs> I read the question for you already. Um, so uh, this is a picture that Shafe took that he yeah, said was fine. not was in the book. Yeah, I was just looking at it on my phone. You can't expand it on the phone. So that's the mm -hmm. good news is, is you can, if it's on your phone, you can make it bigger to look at it. So yeah. me and Shafe are like walking through downtown LA and we see this sign. What would this sign be warning us against? So go ahead and put in your answer if you think you know. <laughs> I think this one was too easy for people. Oh, man, <laughs> have to make it harder next time. Okay, we're revealing the answer. Oh, yeah, uh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, maybe Ken can give the background. Um, yeah, Ken, do you building. have the story? Yeah, so this was uh, adjacent to the Pacific Electric Building. So I show the example of the subway terminal building, which was the terminus for the original one-mile subway system. But the Pacific Electric Building, which was really LA's first skyscraper in the first years of the 20th century, that was the uh, terminus of the Pacific Electric uh, streetcar system, Henry Huntington and his system that really led to the expansion and development of much of Los Angeles. And so that was at a, uh, a point in the sidewalk where the streetcars were turning in to come underneath uh, the building originally in a danger sign to warn, warn pedestrians to watch out. I guess there aren't, nobody really thought there's a lot of loose dog, big loose dog problem in downtown. <laughs> I put that so, in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All okay. right, we're going on to the next one. Okay, Ken, this is you if you want to read it. Okay, this 1971 Brutalist building designed by AC Martin and Associates is closely associated with the citrus heritage of the San Fernando Valley. What and where is it? Um, and there you have four choices. I don't know, again, you may need to make it a little bit bigger, but you can see the kind of white brutalist building on the upper left. I see the votes coming in. Oh, this is fun. <laughs> I think our audience is more, way more sophisticated, John. We have to, have to make these we harder. Should, we should time. have made this harder for people. <laughs> yeah, this is how you learn. But this is what we're going to use uh, next time, Shay, for our trivia. So everyone who's on uh, online right now, uh, we had a trivia night last year where we experimented and it was not exactly what we hoped. And so this is a, actually what we want to use and have probably a trivia night coming up in the fall. And Shafe, I do believe you were the sponsor of our trivia night last year. That was, was. fun, maybe, right? Maybe I'll have to sponsor the next one. I know, right? And so we want to do this again. So I hope, oh, look at that. A lot of people knew this one. So what is the story of the Sunkist building in Sherman Oaks? Well, it's, it was the, uh, the, the headquarters for Sunkist Sun uh, Citrus. And of course, the San Fernando Valley itself uh, was uh, orange groves in, uh, you know, for much of the, the 20th century. So it was somewhat natural that uh, Sunkist located. This is a building that's right off the, the one, and visible from the 101 freeway if you're coming um, into the heart of Los Angeles across the San Fernando Valley. So uh, Sunkist has uh, moved out. Uh, this is a building that is being, uh, a site that's being redeveloped, but in, in great part, thanks to uh, its identification in Survey LA, um, the 1971 structure is being spared and they're building new housing around it on the, uh, what had been the Sunkist parking lot. And Ken, didn't AC Martin and Associates also do the building downtown, the water building? Which building is Department it? Department of did? Water and Power, mm -hmm. among, among many other very significant 
the, 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 the firm had a, a role in LA City Hall, 1928, but Department of Water and Power, um, a more of a modernist uh, landmark of uh, civic landmark of Los Angeles and AC Martin's a very significant um, LA firm. Oh, great. All right, Thoughtful Sparrow is really leading the, the pack here. <laughs> All right, so Shape, you are next. All right, these 1930s streamlined modern buildings in South LA were part of the original campus of a prominent university that relocated in the 1970s. What university is it? Was it? This one there, we have to think a little bit harder. I already guessed because <laughs> I don't actually know that. This answer. was a pretty amazing place mm -hmm. um, to walk through. It really was. I sort of had to sneak in. Um, since I had my orange vest on and uh, there was a company there doing COVID testing, um, I just drove up and they're like, oh, are you here to get the cones? I'm like, yeah, I'm here to get the cones. <laughs> kept going because it's a closed campus now. So it's no, still, that's great. I've heard some school. other stories from you about this where you would have to kind of sneak in and uh, but I, that, I didn't say that on the record. No, off the record. <laughs> All right. We got 31 votes. Do you want We're to giving go ahead? you three, four seconds more before I'm going to close this. Here we go. All right. Pepperdine, excellent. I yep. actually had to guess that. I didn't know the answer. <laughs> All right, Steve, you pulled away to the front. Do we have one more, John, or is that it? We have one more. OK. OK, so if you were paying attention, uh, this may not be so hard. Uh, where is this interior image that opens the Survey LA Discoveries section of the book? And again, four choices of uh, churches and chapels to, to select from. I should have also reminded people that the speed at which they answer goes into their score. Ah. So if you answer quicker, yeah. you end up higher in the leaderboard. That's good. That's good. And they can change their answers. Yes. So that probably slows them down again. I, yeah, this could work really well for trivia night. Yeah, fun. I think it'd be really fun. Yeah. We're thinking, especially as we roll into the fall programming, which uh, if you are not on our mailing list, you please get on our mailing list. We've been sending out some emails lately. Uh, we have over 11,000 people on the list. Oh, here's the answer. Anyway, if you're on the list, you'll get more information about our upcoming programs. We have a lot coming up in September. So the congregational churches seem to be popular with both of you, uh, Shafe and Ken. It must be really amazing in person. It is, it is not that impressive when you walk up to it. And then once you get in it, it's sort of all inspiring. It's really good. Cool. number actually, one? Did somebody get a perfect score? Carl. Well, four, it looks like four, four out of five, though. All, four, all six of these got four out of five, but Carl mm -hmm. was under a minute. All right, Carl, you win the eternal gratitude of the CPF team and the <laughs> author and photographer of this book. Thank you for participating. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and we can go into some Q&A from the audience. If anyone has any questions now is your moment. Oh, I see a couple in the box. Do you want to go ahead and start, John? Yeah, I could start here. I'll start with one question from the Q&A box. Um, and as a reminder, uh, for people that would like to see these answers, uh, these questions answered, they can thumbs up a question if they like it. So the first one I'm going to ask here is what will be the new use of the Sunkist building? I think you mentioned that, Ken, earlier. Yeah, I think, I'm, and I'm trying to recall, I believe the uh, the Sunkist building will remain in office use, but uh, it, it's a, it, it will be a mixed use uh, complex. Most of the new development on the site uh, will be residential, but I believe that um, uh, the intention has been that the uh, historic building remain uh, commercial. Sorry, I was just like typing something in. Go ahead, Chase. No, no, I, I, it's an impressive, it's an impressive building. I've just been driving by it because it's on my way to LA from Ventura, which is one of those things, you know, it's like, I've been driving by it for so long and it always had that Sunkissed logo and now it's got some other, you know, corporate logo on it. Um, you know, so I sort of missed the logo if that's possible. <laughs> Kind of funny what you get attached to. But, um, I'm going to let John try to get one of our, our audience, our participants, get her camera live so she can come on and ask a question. In the meantime, I saw that somebody posted in the Q&A that you couldn't get the quiz to work. We're going to keep using that feature. And so definitely uh, tune in next time. 
and we will be, and you can try again. Uh, it took me a couple of times. Hey, there she is. I wanted to introduce a special guest, Gail Kennard, and she is featured in your preservation profiles, and she is working with a firm. Her father is a famous, I would say famous modernist architect in Los Angeles. Gail, thank you for joining us. It's such an honor to meet you in person, well, in person. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, and congratulations to uh, Ken and 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 Shay for this is amazing work. So I have a question for both of you. So think ahead to twenty five years from now, or say maybe twenty years from now, and if you were to redo this book again, what would you like to see? What would you like to have as as part of the template of Los Angeles that would be worth preserving? Wow, great question, Gail. This is why uh, Gail is one of the preservation profiles <laughs> in the book, and uh, and Gail is uh, uh, vice president of our Cultural Heritage Commission uh, as well in Los Angeles. Um, you know, it, it's a it's a an excellent question. I I would hope that uh, through the book, through you know, through the work that we've done in Los Angeles and some of the awareness we're building through the book, that we will have. Um, you know, a set of historic resources that even more fully reflect all of the diverse stories of all communities um, in Los Angeles. Um, so I believe, you know, and I'm proud that we've begun to, to capture that. And again, you know, there's a chapter in the book that really highlights that in particular with some of the historic context work that we've done and many of the survey LA, LA discoveries reflect those stories. Um, but we have a lot of work to do in that area and we're continuing and Gail is part of uh, a lot of discussions that we're having currently and uh, about extending our partnership with the, Get the Getty on Survey LA to create, uh, as an example, a new Los Angeles African American Historic Places project, uh, which over the next two to three years is meant to advance uh, additional historic cultural monument nominations for African American heritage sites and really um, take a, a broader approach to cultural preservation, going beyond some of our traditional historic preservation tools in many of our um, historically African American communities. We hope that that work will be a, a template for expanding that type of, um, uh, you know, thinking really advancing the field, uh, working with many of our communities in Los Angeles. So I, I guess I would hope that in the next 20 or 25 years, uh, that work really will have borne fruit and that uh, we will have um, really uh, become aware of uh, resources that perhaps we're not even aware of now and uh, um, employed some you know, more creative approaches for really recognizing, protecting and celebrating some of that heritage. Time also marches on uh, in preservation and uh, you know, Survey LA was I think forward looking in its time. It started in 2006 and we, we kind of used 1980 as the cutoff for uh, historic resources. So we, we, we surveyed buildings that were constructed before 1980, but now we're sitting here 15 years later. And I think we, we need to take stock of the architecture and the history of the 1980s and 1990s and then uh, in later periods. So, you know, the, the sequel 25 years from now would also have to really grapple with that time period, which was not only a, a fruitful time for architecture, whether you like those architectural styles or not, but a period of great social change and mm -hmm. uh, immigration and demographic change in Los Angeles. Um, and uh, taking stock of that history would be, uh, I think what we'd also have to look at in that next time period. Mm -hmm. Gail, would you mind if I, uh, I turned around and asked you a question? Sure. <laughs> um, I was reading your profile and I love the story that you tell about the little boy who asks uh, his father, who's telling him a bad bedtime story, um, how come the lion never wins? And then the father responds, the lion will win when he gets to tell his own stories. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on how, how can uh, people who are interested in these historic places best tell the stories of them? What is, in your experience, how, how, how can we communicate the importance of these places? Well, that, that's a really great question because historically um, the preservation world has really been focused on the architectural, the, the outward looks of buildings, the design, all those elements, which are critically important. I'm the last one to say that architecture is not important, but we tell the stories so that people understand the narrative of, of who we are and how we came to be. And we've not always that. 
So if we can capture the social history through buildings and places and even landscapes, then the folks that are coming along now and after us will know that Long Los Angeles was an amazing place and it was created by a group of people from many, many different parts of the world who brought amazing um, talents and skills to us. So the stories are important. So preservation has a role in telling those stories aside from just the built environment. Thank you so much for your time today. And I really appreciate your question for Ken. That was a great question. Um, so what we're gonna do is close out with one final question from the Q&A box. Thank you, Gail. We're gonna stop your video <laughs> just okay. so you- Hi, everyone. <laughs> Bye, Bye, Gail. Bye. Thank you. Um, and the final question from the Q&A box, I'm sure our speakers may see it. Um, it's about the Mills Act program. Um, so the attendee is asking, uh, they were saying that the Mills Act program was canceled this year in LA. I, I wasn't aware of that, but um, they also heard it's being canceled next year. And how does, uh, how do you think the Mills Act, programs like the Mills Act can contribute to preservation? Yeah, I mean, the Mills Act is our most important uh, local incentive for historic preservation. You know, we talk about it in the book and highlight projects that have been made possible in great part uh, due to the Mills Act. We have put a, a temporary, we, we, the Mills Act program is still very active. We have uh, almost a thousand properties uh, under contract in Los Angeles under the Mills Act program. We're actively working with those owners. Uh, we did put a pause this year on new applications. Uh, to the Mills Act due to some fiscal considerations. And really in part also, we wanted to do a comprehensive assessment of our Mills Act program after 25 years of running this program to make the program more sustainable uh, financially in terms of staffing and to really look at the equity considerations around the program, who is benefiting, how to make the program meet some of our city's um, equity goals. And so we're wrapping up that uh, comprehensive program assessment currently. Um, we haven't made any um, decisions yet about the startup of taking in applications next year, uh, but we hope to share with the public and have a very robust community engagement process around some of the recommendations and a, a report that uh, is being finalized now with an assessment and, we, and something we can share with CPF and more broadly as well um, as to how to make the Mills Act program uh, more effective and meet some of our preservation goals. Thank you, Ken. Um, it is 12.58, so we do have time for one more question if anybody has any, but while we're doing that, I'm going to paste into the chat box an option for feedback about today's program. We'd like to hear your thoughts. And maybe you can let us know in the chat box a question that came up earlier today among us at CPF was whether we should hold these book clubs uh, in the evening or in the afternoon around lunchtime. And we're gonna be doing a lot more of these. We have two coming up that are definitely happening, but we wanna continue it for uh, quite a while. So if you think it's better to hold it in the evening, just let us know in the chat box. Or if you think it's better during lunchtime, just let us know in the chat box and we'll make note of that so that we can schedule these appropriately for everyone. Um, I just well, put in sort of a, yeah. John, there was sort of a question in the chat box about your background. Uh, which you chose, which I happen to photograph, so I'm sort of partial <laughs> to it, uh, which is the oh, yeah. Clark Library, which was an ARG project. Um, and uh, I guess uh, it was a pretty amazing, not only seismic retro retrofit, but um, insertion of an elevator shaft and underground access and uh, a lot of conservation work by them. Um, and uh, I went out and photographed that. And it does make a pretty handsome background, like you're sitting in a library with um, with <laughs> kinetic shoulder pads on. <laughs> I know, yeah. Well, thanks for, for uh, pointing that out, Shafe. And I did, I put the information in the chat window. It was a Preservation Design Award winner for rehabilitation. So um, I think we had one question just asking about community planning. And I think that pertains to the chapter also that you had. What I was interested in is what's it like in downtown Los Angeles right now? Because, you know, I was, I was born in downtown LA in the 60s. I went there a lot over the years and it would come back and then it would fall and it would come back and then it would fall. It was just coming back so strong in 2019 with restaurants opening and places opening and had a lot of vibrant activity and then everything has changed. So what is it like right now, uh, Ken, for people who are not in California? Yeah, I know it's a great question. And uh, yeah, I mean, the, the book really does tell the story of downtown's renaissance as a result of uh, adaptive reuse, which created the residential base for so many other things to happen, including restaurants and nightlife. 
Um, obviously, a lot of that coming together, uh, you know, uh, gathering has um, has has been undercut uh, by COVID, and uh, a lot of the uh, larger uses, you know, many of the cultural centers and theaters have not been um, or just now starting to be active again. So. I think downtown is is just kind of coming out of this um, you know this difficult period, and I'm I'm ultimately optimistic uh, about downtown, and we continue to see a lot of development activity of new housing with you know the adaptive reuse really created that residential base that has now made downtown a very attractive site for uh, new residential activity, and I think as we come out of this period. Um, what I one of the things I said in that COVID afterward is that people are going to want to gravitate to historic places uh, as we're coming out of this time period. It's historic places that give us that sense of continuity and connectedness of past, present, and future. Um, and they're more valued than ever. And it really, downtown has some of our highest concentration of places that, that people value and want to reconnect to. So I think that will serve downtown very well coming out of this period. That's great. Um, thanks, Ken. I wanted to share my screen. Can you see this okay, John? Yes, we can. Great. So I wanted to, we're going to close out in just a second, but I wanted to also remind everyone that we're having another one of these discussions on August 31st with Alan Hess talking about his five books on Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, we'll be posting on our, our website uh, all five of those books at places where you can get that. They're all from Rizzoli. And I think uh, Alan had recommended in particular to read the one about natural design if you have specific questions. So that's going to be coming up. And then, as I mentioned before, uh, we're going to be welcoming Allison Rose Jefferson, and she's going to be talking about living the California dream, African-American leisure sites during the Jim Crow era. Sorry about that. Everything just jumped ahead. Um, that'll be sometime in November. We'd like you to, we'd like to thank our annual sponsors. And we want to finish off with just a request. If you feel like donating to CPF, we would really appreciate it. It's donors like you who have really helped us keep all these programs free. And I wanted to thank again in particular Nelson and Richard Antonio. Uh, Sim, Gail, and Alan for contributing to our program today. And Ken and Shafe, we are so grateful for your time and your expertise. This has been so much fun. I definitely want to do it again. It was fun. No, thanks so much, Chris and John. This is great. John, did you want to go ahead and close it out? I'm closing out. So all I'll say is if you want to leave feedback about today's program, go to californiapreservation.org slash E. And I'm going to stop our video and close this out. So we'll see you at the next one. Thanks, everyone. See you soon.